Hi everyone! So I'm looking forward to doing this review session on the 12 links of Dependent Arising. I thought to do it outside and feature some animal realm, and uh, but who knows, you know, she might actually be a Buddha. It's hard to know. But anyway, I thought that um, over the next two Wednesdays we'd review the 12 links. Some of it will be things that you studied with Venerable Amy, and some of it will be hopefully from the perspective of the philosophical tenet schools. So when we look at the 12 links of dependent arising, just keep remembering that the main point is to develop renunciation. And whether it's renunciation from samsara, the determination to be free, the technical renunciation, or whether it's just a recognition that doing the same old thing will lead to the same old thing, and if we don't recognize the windows of opportunity to change our habits, we're going to keep suffering in the same way we always have. And if we don't feel like we're suffering that much, motivate ourselves by thinking we won't be as effective if we keep our mind at the state it's at now. What we do now is helpful, but maybe we could do more, and maybe it could be deeper. So when you look at these 12 links, let's examine it in this way. The Wheel of Life and the 12 Links of Dependent Arising A method to understand our uncontrolled cyclic existence and to become genuinely motivated to leave that samsara, the contaminated, appropriated aggregates bound by karma and klesha. The image of the Wheel of Life was commissioned by Shakyamuni Buddha himself after the success of the descriptions of it from Modgalyana and Shariputra. These two heart disciples of the Buddha had traveled to these realms and came back and explained what they saw there. Upon hearing their descriptions, many students developed uncontrived renunciation from samsara. So then there became a tradition ever after to have this image at the doorway or the entrance of all monasteries and dharma centers whenever possible, basically to indicate that the reason for going into the temple is in order to get out of samsara. At the top, we have Buddha pointing to the moon. This represents liberation. So it indicates that nirvana, the moon, is possible, and the way is to be out of the wheel, samsara, like the Buddha. Buddha is also visible in all realms, showing the ability to return to samsaric environments, to interact and benefit samsaric beings, while being out of samsara oneself. And so remember that samsara is the five aggregates themselves, that in a sense we are samsara, and the environment that we see is reflection of a samsaric mind. But the way we perceive that external reality is in a samsaric way. So the Buddha can interact with samsaric beings without being hooked or captured or drawn or tempted by all of the appearances that us samsaric beings see. He's broken the spell. Then we have the monster, Yama, the Lord of Death in general symbolizes impermanence and uncontrolled death. We talked about this when we did our retreat related to the Wheel of Sharp Weapons, discussing karma. The outer yama is death, which stops our life. The inner yama is the afflictions, which make us take rebirth in cyclic existence without choice. The secret yama is the latencies of ignorance, and the subtlest dualistic perception through which things still appear to be inherently existent, although they are not. Yama is sometimes depicted with two eyes and a furrow between his eyebrows, or with three eyes, sometimes represented with curled hair at the top, or crowned by five skulls. So Yama's two arms are karma and disturbing emotions, what keeps us trapped in samsara and all negative, destructive patterns. His three eyes shows that he, quote, dominates the three times, past, present, and future, unless remedies are applied. The five school crown, when it's depicted, represents the five main afflictions, ignorance, attachment, anger, pride, jealousy. 
And remember that the transformed version of those five become the five wisdoms. So the four fangs of Yama, only two of which are visible, represent the four Maras. And you'll see some explanations of the Wheel of Life where they call Yama Mara. But if we're talking about the four Maras, what we're talking about is the Mara or the demon of the aggregates, which really just means clinging to aggregates as inherently existent. The Mara of destructive emotions, our addiction to our afflictions. Mara of the Lord of Death, death and impermanence itself. And Mara of the sons of the gods, our craving for pleasure, etc. So the point of all of this is this demonic force is really just of our own creation and symbolic, and it's holding us trapped in this pattern. The intersections represent the six realms, the arrangement of which varies in different images, but the god realm is usually at 12 o'clock up at the top, and the hell realms are usually at 6 o'clock down at the bottom. So at the top, the god realm, the dominant disturbing emotion is pride. And pride in this context is that looking down on others, seeing oneself as superior. And so it's not confidence that we're talking about. We're talking about an affliction, a disturbing emotion. And that pride has a lot of unfortunate features, but one of them is that you become so self-centered that you don't notice your impact on others. In the human realm, if we have a lot of pride, we can start to feel very isolated from others because we're just too good to be around anyone else. We're better than everyone else, and that makes us all alone. Pride can feed self-loathing and depression because pride is inflated, it's exaggerated, it doesn't really understand the nature of our own self, and so we're always looking to perform at the level our pride says that we are. When we don't perform at that level, then we become disappointed in ourselves, depressed, deflated, defensive. So pride is awful in the human experience. In the God realm experience, for the most part, it just gives an ignoring aspect. Ignoring the suffering of others, unaware of the suffering and plight of others, and just indulges. So a God realm experience is just kind of pure indulgence, using up all the positive karma without creating more, and eventually the good karma runs out, and often the next rebirth after a god realm is the hells, because they have so little merit left. The demigod realm is similarly pleasurable, but their dominant disturbing emotion is jealousy. And so they have an inflated sense of themselves together with all of this comparison of people who have more, who can do more, who have developed qualities. It's looking up in a competitive way and it's very agitated. So if you think of your own human experience of jealousy, it often has the words, well, that's not fair, or I could do that. It has a lot of this kind of um, comparative thing where you're looking at people who are above yourself and uh, annoyed that they have more than you do. Whereas pride is looking down, jealousy is looking up. But both of them are competitive and comparing and exaggerated. The human realm, the dominant disturbing emotion is attachment or desirous attachment. This kind of hunger and craving that we have permeating all of our existence. Of course, the human realm is actually the best realm to practice the spiritual path because while there is pleasure which can distract us, there is also pain which could distract us or could give us an opportunity to question what causes suffering, what causes happiness, build pathways of empathy to other people who suffer. So we have enough suffering to make us motivated to want to get rid of it, but also enough happiness, comfort, resources, and support that we can access tools to end suffering. In the hungry ghost realm, the dominant disturbing emotion is miserliness. So greed, hoarding, clinging, it's very much related to attachment, can be related to pride as well, 
But it's this mind that thinks, what I have is not enough, it can never be enough. And they're depicted sometimes as having very huge empty bellies and very tiny skinny necks to indicate that even when they access resources, it's very difficult for them to swallow them, absorb them, and to feel full by them. In the human realm, when we're talking about a hungry ghost mentality or a miserly mentality, we're speaking about addiction. We're talking about the mind of an addict who is kind of chasing that first high experience, who is never feeling full, who has that constant sense of deep, sad emptiness, trying to fill it in all sorts of unskillful ways. The animal realm, the dominant disturbing emotion is ignorance. And there's also a lot of fear. So animals, of course, can learn things, can generate positive karma by looking after each other. There's a lot of amazing things that happen in the animal realm, but it's very difficult to study and progress along the path. And most of the life is dominated by wanting food, killing or hiding, you know, it's all pretty basic. And, um, so we don't want to be reborn as an animal, even an intelligent one, like a dolphin or something. We don't really want to be in the animal realm again. Then we have the hell realms. The dominant disturbing emotion is hatred or strong anger, ill will, the wish to harm. And when you have this wish to harm, it creates an environment reflective of that. So if you have hot boiling rage, you create the cause for an environment full of fire. And if you have cold, withholding, icy, passive aggressive anger, then you create an environment for yourself that looks like ice. And the hell realms are places that we theoretically have all been, probably all been in for many eons. And it's an existence where there is so much suffering, it can't even occur to us to practice virtue because we're in just so much pain. The pain the hell realm beings experience is far more than the pain of a human being. If we experience the pain of the hell realm beings, we would just die. But they can actually have an experience of pain that is far worse than our worst pain, but they don't have the karma for that to be related to the end of their life. So their capacity for suffering is more than ours. And so it's an incredibly tragic place to be reborn in, but it's not forever. It's not a punishment. It's what our own minds create for ourselves. So when they, you know, finish that negative karma, when it all gets exhausted down there, then they get reborn somewhere higher. None of this is forever, but samsara is forever, unless we break the wheel. So just to review here, also in Hebrew, if that helps. Then we have the small inner ring, half black, half white, repeated progression from higher, happier realms to lower suffering realms. Bird of attachment, snake of anger, pig of ignorance represented by this very desirous bird, snake because snakes are easily angered, pig because they eat whatever without discrimination, love those who will kill them. We've gone through these three many times, so that's just review. Then we have the depictions of the actual 12 links of dependent arising. Ignorance is represented by a blind person. This depiction can sound ableist, like we're saying that blind people are somehow ignorant or stupid. What it's really saying is we don't see reality as it is, or we see it wrongly. So more on ignorance in a minute. Karmic formations is depicted by a potter and various sized pots, representing that karma is of different weights based on different conditions. Consciousness is depicted by the monkey, Obviously, our monkey mind chasing after different things, being distracted, excitable, etc. Those first three, ignorance, karmic formations, and consciousness, are what are really important to understand today, and then I'll briefly go through the rest of them as well. Number four is name and form, and this is represented by a ship with people in it, 
and is referencing the five aggregates. Number five is the six sources, represented by an empty house with six windows. Then we have contact, represented by a couple. Feeling, represented by an arrow entering into the eye of a person, showing how very difficult it is to ignore our feelings. They're that prominent of an experience. Then we have craving, a person with alcohol, sometimes a person being handed alcohol. Grasping, human or monkey, jumping at fruit. Number 10 is called becoming or potential existence. Some newer translations even call it renewed existence. And this is depicted by a pregnant woman. Occasionally, this is also depicted by a couple in union. Birth is represented by a woman giving birth and refers to rebirth specifically. Old age and death are counted as one, and it's represented by an old person carrying a corpse on their back. So those are the pictorial representations and the order in which we normally teach them. This is not actually the order in which they happen experientially. Here are those terms in Hebrew in case that's useful. You can find it in your handout from our karma retreat last year. So before we go into the order they actually happen, let's review. The following is an animated summary of the Wheel of Life from the Asian Art Museum, video from YouTube channel of Kenneth F. Thornton. Again, this is the order of the image and the teaching, not the order of actualization. What's wrong with me? It might be your first reaction when something happens with friends or family or work. The chances are it's not you. It's the world you were born into. A world whose terms and conditions you never signed up to. But now that you're here, it helps you have a guide to the terrain and how to escape it. And that's exactly what this Tibetan Buddhist mandala, showing the wheel of life, is designed to give you. To look at this image is to look in the mirror, to see yourself and how and why you suffer the way you do. It's the same for everyone. We understand less than we'd like to admit. We're pig ignorant if we're being uncharitable. Our anger and our fear build so fast, they can take us by surprise, whipping and snapping like a snake. And we get proud like a rooster of people and things in the world. We become hopelessly attached to them. Each of these habits feeds off the others like three animals biting one another's tails. Bad news all round, it seems. But actually, it's not. This mandala shows us that we live in the best of all possible worlds. In higher realms, the gods are distracted with pleasure. Those in the lower realms are overcome with pain. Our lives contain just the right balance of both to help us see the bigger picture. That all of this, pleasure and pain, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth is forever changing and turning, and that escape is possible. The Buddha has done it. He is free of the cycle. And through his teachings, he shows us how we can do the same. It's a truth and a destination that can never be captured in words. Instead, the mandala pictures it as a far-off moon, and the Buddha points the way. Reviewing Ignorance from a Drop from the Ocean of Minds and Mental Factors combined by Fedor Strack, Happy Monk's publication. The definition of ignorance can take two aspects, a not knowing mental factor or a mental factor that distortedly apprehends the object. As such, it is either a not realizing consciousness or a wrong consciousness. But the final antidote against ignorance is always the non-dual, transcendental wisdom, realizing selflessness. So there are divisions below and functions below, but ignorance of self-grasping, according to the Middle Way School, is always a wrong consciousness that mistakenly apprehends its object. It is a misapprehension of self, 
which falsely adds or superimposes the characteristic of inherent existence, in actuality, the self is empty of that type of existence. The self exists in mere name, labeled on the valid basis of the aggregates. The wisdom realizing emptiness of an inherently existent self is the key component of liberation. So now we'll look at the actual link of ignorance, specifically. The following explanation is from the Sanskrit tradition. A brief explanation of the Pali tradition's perspective on a link is mentioned in cases where it differs or adds a unique perspective. This is from Samsara, Nirvana, and Buddha Nature by the Dalai Lama and Thupten Chodron. 1. Ignorance The ignorance that is the root of samsara is beginningless. The Buddha said, A first beginning of ignorance, monastics, cannot be discerned, of which it can be said, Before that, there was no ignorance, and it came to be after that. Though this is so, monastics, yet a specific condition of ignorance is discerned. So the definition from Science and Philosophy in the Indian Buddhist Classics, Volume 2, The Mind, ignorance usually refers to an afflictive ignorance, which is a distorted awareness. It is a mental factor rather than a primary mind or main mind. Ignorance is not simply not knowing the truth. It is the opposite of knowing the truth a radical misunderstanding of reality. Although ignorance and cyclic existence are beginningless, in the evolution of a particular lifetime, ignorance is its initial cause. There are various explanations of what ignorance is. Some say it is obscuration. Others say it actively misapprehends how a person exists. Some say it observes the aggregates and conceives them to be a self-sufficient, substantially existent person, others assert that it observes the mere eye and grasps it to be inherently existent person, some associate the view of a personal identity with ignorance, others say they are unrelated mental factors. According to the view held in common by all tenet schools and the Pali tradition, First link ignorance is the lack of understanding of the four truths of the Aryas and of the three characteristics of conditioned phenomena, impermanence, dukkha, and not-self, that leads to rebirth in samsara. So just quickly reviewing those, the four truths of the Aryas refers to the four noble truths, truth of suffering, truth of origin, true cessations, true paths. The three characteristics of conditioned phenomena are the first three of the four seals, adherence to which marks one as a holder of Buddhist tenets. One, that all compounded phenomena are impermanent. Two, all contaminated phenomena are in the nature of suffering. Three, all phenomena are selfless. Four, nirvana is peace. So because we're talking about the three characteristics of conditioned phenomena, we just speak of the first three. It is ignorance of these first three that all tenet schools agree on is related to first link ignorance, as well as ignorance of the Four Noble Truths, or the Four Truths of the Aryas. So according to the Prasangikas, it is a moment of the innate ignorance grasping the person as inherently existent that leads to rebirth in samsara. So we'll return to this presentation, but just briefly, the 12 links related to the Four Noble Truths, all 12 links can be grouped in one of three categories. Some of the links are suffering, some of the links are karma, some of the links are disturbing emotions. So we'll look at that categorization later, but basically look at cyclic existence in this way. We talk about suffering of the three types, Suffering of suffering, suffering of change, suffering of conditioning. That's the first noble truth. Because of that suffering, we usually generate disturbing emotions like attachment, anger, ignorance, etc. Because of our disturbing emotions, we usually generate negative karma 
which has a fully ripened propelling effect, rebirth in one of the six realms, an environmental effect, the external situation that we're in, the effect similar to the cause, which includes the tendency to both commit the action again and to experience similar actions to those you committed initially. So because of those karmic seeds, then it turns into suffering. So this is the wheel of life in brief. Suffering leads to disturbing emotions, leads to karma, leads to suffering. If we were to categorize the 12 links in terms of afflictions, disturbing emotions, negative states of mind, those would be ignorance, craving, and grasping. The ones that go under the category of suffering are consciousness, name and form, six sources, contact, feeling, birth, aging and death. And the links that are karma are karmic formations and becoming. That's basically describing the first two noble truths. The second noble truth is described in karma and disturbing emotions. So then to reverse cyclic existence or end cyclic existence, we talk about the third noble truth, cessation, which in this case, very briefly, is related to a direct perceptual realization of emptiness that cuts the misapprehension of self, that binds one to samsara, and the fourth noble truth, path, with the support of renunciation, one goes on to liberation. So in this whole 12 links discussion, everything is dependently arising. Explicitly, truth of suffering and truth of causes or true origins are explicitly described in the teaching on the 12 links depicted in that wheel of life image. The third and fourth noble truths are indicated by the Buddha pointing to the moon. Ignorance grasps the inherent existence of persons and phenomena, whereas the view of a personal identity grasps the inherent existence of only our own I and mine. All beings except arhats, bodhisattvas on the eighth ground or higher, and Buddhas have ignorance. But only ordinary beings, those below the path of seeing, have first link ignorance. Aryas of the three vehicles, who have not eradicated all afflictive obscurations, have ignorance. However, it is not strong enough to produce karma that projects a samsaric rebirth, and thus is not first-link ignorance. First-link ignorance is the specific moments of ignorance grasping inherent existence and the view of a personal identity that lie behind the motivation performance, and completion of a virtuous or non-virtuous karma powerful enough to project a rebirth in samsara. It is not other moments of ignorance or other types of ignorance that occur in our lives. In short, first lake ignorance is the view of a personal identity that newly motivates its set, that set of 12 links, second branch, formative action, or karmic formations. This ignorance actively grasps the self as existing in a way it does not. It is the root of samsara, the principal cause of rebirth in cyclic existence. In short, First link ignorance and the view of a personal identity are always neutral. The virtuous or non-virtuous mental factors that arise after them determine the ethical value of the actions that follow. As the initial motivation, first link ignorance is the principal driving force that leads to formative karma. Distorted conceptions may arise after it, Grasping the impermanent as permanent, what is dukkha by nature as happiness, the unattractive as attractive, and the selfless as having a coarse self. 
Distorted attention that exaggerates the good or bad qualities of an object may also arise. Due to these distorted conceptions, the immediate motivation, such as ignorance of karma and its effects, coupled with other afflictions, arise. With attachment, we plan, connive, and manipulate to get the objects of our desire. Then we lie or steal to make them ours. When our desires are thwarted, anger arises and develops into malice or hatred. We plan and act out retaliatory actions, mistakenly believing that anger protects us. Attachment and anger, in the above examples, are not a distinct link. Some sages consider them as part of the first link. Others say that they are the second link. Karma Review Substantial cause, whatever is the main thing that turns into a result. For example, wood is the substantial cause of a table, the carpenter is a cooperative condition. The substantial cause for happiness is a previous moment of positive karma created through beneficial actions of body, speech, or mind. The cooperative condition are things like the present moment attitude, the people and places around us. Then karma, intentional action, it includes intention karma, mental action, and intended karma, physical and verbal actions motivated by intention. Karmic seeds, the potency from previously created actions that will bring their results. They'll bring their results unless they have been purified so more explicitly, karma refers to the mental factor of intention or volition. When either virtuous or non-virtuous intention arises in the mind stream of an ordinary being, such ethically potent intention leaves propensities or karmic seeds upon the mental consciousness. Such seeds in turn, once awakened, produce effects commiserate with their ethical value. Condition, Conditions are impermanent entities that assist causes in producing their effects. Cooperative condition, that which produces an effect that exists outside its own substantial continuum. That which produces the attributes of the basis constituting the effect instead of the basis of those attributes. So then the link of karma karmic formations, or volitional formations, the distorted actions of body, speech, and mind that arise from ignorance, attachment, and aversion stain the mind with what are called volitional formations. This is the second of the twelve links. The moment after we create a distorted karma, the action itself has passed and is gone, but it leaves on our stream of consciousness an imprint that remains there until it either manifests in the future as a favorable or unfavorable experience, depending on the nature of the original action, or is otherwise disposed of. Read Purified. So that presentation was from Geshe Rapton. So reviewing, creating karma that is strong enough to project a rebirth needs to have the three branches complete. The preparation, the action is done, the action is completed. Once that seed has been planted, when it meets with conditions, it has different results. The ripened result, the future rebirth state you will experience as a result of having created a complete karma. Results similar to the cause in experience. Results similar to the cause in actions. Environmental results, when born in a human realm, you will experience results of your actions in the form of environmental conditions. Consciousness Review In the highlighted portion, the experience of the clear light, which is said to be like a clear, cloudless autumn sky just before dawn, represents the mind at its subtlest. An awareness of it is called the natural clear light. When the practitioner maintains awareness of it, 
she has realized the fundamental nature of the mind itself, in that the clear light is the subtle basis for all other mental content. So that's the tantric presentation, which is the most subtle. That's from His Holiness's book, Sleeping, Dreaming, and Dying, an Exploration of Consciousness. Then when we talk in terms of primary principle consciousness, just in general or more broadly, the main cognition posited by means of apprehending the entity of its object. Synonymous with main mind, it is one of the two divisions of mind, the other being mental factors. There are six main minds, one for each sense consciousness, eye, ear, and so forth, and mental consciousness. For more, see the Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive glossary. So the link of consciousness, the continuity of the mind stream serves as the basis of the imprints of karma. This is the third link, the link of consciousness. It carries the imprints and later helps them ripen and manifest in the same way that seeds are sown in the earth which then serves as a cause for the growth of a crop. However, not only must seeds be sown in the ground, they also require favorable conditions to grow. Contributory causes such as water, fertilizer, and so forth must be present in order for the seeds to ripen and reach maturity. Third link consciousness is primarily to the polluted mental consciousness that is just joined to the next rebirth under the control of afflictions and karma. Third link consciousness does not refer to all consciousnesses. It is not a sense consciousness, nor is it the consciousness of a Buddha, pure ground bodhisattva, or arhat, because they are no longer reborn under the power of afflictions and karma. Third link consciousness afflicts transmigratory beings because it leads to the next rebirth. The third link refers only to the mental consciousness of two specific moments, causal consciousness and resultant consciousness, and as such, this third link is subdivided into two. Summary of the Twelve Links of Dependent Arising Extract from Calm Abiding and Spiritual Insight, pages 203 to 207, by Geshe Gendon Ludru, translated and edited by Jeffrey Hopkins. Because of ignorance, an action is accumulated, and in the next moment there is consciousness, the third of the twelve links of dependent arising. This means that as an action, or karmic formation, approaches cessation, it deposits a potency on the consciousness. Actualization of the third link, consciousness, and cessation of the second, action, karmic formations, are simultaneous. At this time, the action has become the entity of a potency that remains with the consciousness. Since the second link, action, cannot remain permanently, what can remain, and how, until its effect ripens in another rebirth, possibly far in the future. This question is much debated, and all four schools of tenets have different answers. The third link, consciousness, has two factors. The consciousness at the time of the cause, and the consciousness at the time of the effect, or result. The first refers to consciousness that exists at the time of the action, until the new consciousness impelled by that potency is appropriated, that is, until the rebirth, which is an effect of that action, takes place. The fourth link is name and form, which is more precisely called name and or form. The four of the five aggregates, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness, are called the name basis. Form then refers to the form aggregate. This link is to be understood as either name or form because if an action impels a rebirth into the formless realm, there are only four name base aggregates. The form aggregate is absent. Thus, the person is designated just in dependence on the four name aggregates. The fifth link, sense spheres or six sources, 
refers to the twelve sense spheres, the sense powers, and the sense consciousnesses, which are actualized simultaneously with assuming a new rebirth. The sixth, contact, refers to the ability of the body consciousness to make contact with tangible objects. The seventh, feeling, means the ability to know which of the three feelings, pleasure, pain, or neutrality, is arising. The eight, attachment or craving, refers to the desire for taking rebirth. This could mean wanting to be reborn as a god or some type of attachment related to the rebirth one will take. For example, if at the time of death one feels, I want to be warmer, or I want to be colder, this is not the usual attachment, but an uncommon form of it that has bearing on the type of rebirth one will take. The ninth link, grasping, is also a case of attachment, but is distinguished by the fact that whereas the attachment previously discussed is a mere aspiration, this link refers to the actual taking up of the next life. The tenth, existence, also called becoming, or potential existence, or renewed existence, is really similar to action, karmic formations. But, as was already mentioned, the action has ceased and become of the nature of consciousness. Until the occurrence of the birth, of which that action is the cause, the latency or potency of that action remains as a neutral phenomena. Existence is the name given to the latency when it has been nurtured by attachment and grasping, and there becomes able to produce the effect of taking up the new life. The eleventh link, birth, refers to the actual taking birth through the power of that action. The twelfth is either aging or death. In the first moment, rebirth is taken. In the second, aging is actualized. This link is called aging and or death because there are cases of taking rebirth and dying the very next moment without aging. This is a rough explanation of the names of the twelve links of dependent arising. Are the twelve links actualized in this order? No. This is not the order of their actualization, but the order in which they are taught. We'll look at the order of actualization next week. Today we looked at the teaching order and the order of the image. We also looked at the way in which to group the twelve links into the categories of afflictions, suffering, and karma. Now we'll look at breaking the links. There is a chance to break our patterns at a few really important junctures. We can break the link between suffering, turning into an affliction, through either lojong, mind training techniques, rejoicing and exhausting our negative karma without becoming reactive or resistant to it, and practice tonglen, giving and taking practice. So we can bear our suffering well, basically, and just allow negative karma to exhaust itself without creating any new. We might miss that window, and suffering does turn into afflictions. So to break the link between afflictions and karma, you can again practice lojong techniques, like Shantideva saying, remain like a block of wood. Or you can remember the suffering that comes from negative karma to both self and others. So before afflictions turn into negative karma, you restrain yourself and choose not to act from that place. To remain like a block of wood doesn't mean to repress or to suppress. It means that you stay still and calm and let your natural clarity reassert itself while the wave of the affliction passes. If you miss the window there, you can break the link between karma turning into suffering through purification. And the key ways of purification are using Vajrasattva practice with the four opponent powers or meditation on the emptiness of inherent existence. The first three links, ignorance, karmic formations, and consciousness, are the most important for us to understand today.